Please keep your Bibles open at that passage we have just read together in the letter of James in chapter 1. And this evening, as we continue in our studies in the letter written by James, I want us to focus then on these opening four verses, verses 1 to 4 of James chapter 1. And the title for this evening's sermon is The Trials of Faith. The Trials of Faith. And right at the outset, let me say to you, the Christian faith is no walk in the park. It is no easy thing to be a Bible-believing Christian. Time and time again in the New Testament, Jesus warns his followers that if you follow me, you can expect hardship. Jesus said it in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you. Falsely on my account, rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And again, when Jesus sends out the twelve apostles, he says to them, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep into the midst of wolves. And they will deliver you over to the courts. And they will flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake. And brother will deliver brother over to death. And father his child. And children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Or again when Jesus tells his disciples about his own crucifixion. That he must go to Jerusalem. That he must be handed over to the leaders. That he must die upon the cross. He says to them and if anyone would come after me. Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So then when James writes this letter to the believers who have been scattered because of persecution and when he speaks of the trials of faith, he's not saying anything that hasn't already been said by the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the reality of what it means to be a true Bible-believing Christian. This is the norm for the Christian. Persecution is the standard. Hardship is to be typical for us. Suffering is normal for the Christian. And yet we live such wonderfully comfortable lives. We live in the kind of material prosperity our grandparents could only dream of. And we have access to health care and education that is free at the point of delivery. And despite the recent restrictions we face because of the pandemic, we nevertheless enjoy unparalleled liberty to worship God and proclaim the gospel. You know, compared to Christians who lived in other times and compared to Christians who live in other parts of the world today, we enjoy so many privileges and freedoms and comforts. But I want you to realize, as you sit in the midst of comfort tonight, it is not always so for the Christians. In fact, it was hardly ever so for Bible-believing Christians. True Bible-believing, Bible-obeying, Bible-loving, Bible-proclaiming Christians have always suffered for their faith. And it is certainly true of the people to whom James wrote this letter. He says he is writing to the twelve tribes in the dispersion. To those who have been dispersed. That's what it says in verse 1. In verse 1 it says James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion. Greetings to you. Now in all likelihood James is writing to the believers who were scattered away from Jerusalem in the first great persecution that arose after the death of Stephen. That's why we read earlier in our service uh, from the book of Acts that describes what happened to Stephen. And then in chapter 8, verse 1, in the book of Acts, it says, And there arose on that day, not just a persecution, but a great persecution. 
against the church in Jerusalem and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except for the apostles. So that means then that these believers that James is writing to, they have lost everything. They have lost their property. They have lost their family inheritances. They have lost their friends and relations. They have become poor and destitute. They have been turned into exiles and refugees. They had been dragged to court. They had been made vulnerable. They had been exploited by the powerful and the wealthy. They had lost everything because they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ as their own saviour. And that's the situation that these original readers of the letter of James find themselves in. And it's why James writes to them. And before he says anything else, he says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know, you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now you may say, well, we don't face hardships like those people did. Uh, we've not been displaced from our homes because of our faith. We've not been forced to leave everything behind and become exiles and refugees because of our faith. And you say, we enjoy comforts and liberties unknown in history. And So what relevance could these verses of James have for us? Well, I would say two things in response to that. First of all, that this letter of James was copied and circulated amongst all the early church and it received canonical status in the New Testament precisely because it was full of divine truth which is applicable to all Christians everywhere in every situation and in every circumstance and down through the generations. So even if our lives are not precisely the same as the original recipients of this letter, there is still much that we can learn from it. But second, I would say this to you, and I say it to you in all seriousness. I believe persecution is coming for us. I believe the freedoms and the comforts we have enjoyed are being quickly eroded. I believe there is a soft totalitarianism that is creeping into Western society which is going to make life very hard for any true Bible-proclaiming, Bible-loving, Bible-obeying Christian. You know, the standards that are revealed in Scripture, they are utterly offensive to the new progressive ideology that seems to be sweeping through the Western world. And not only is it sweeping through the Western world, I see it sweeping into the evangelical churches of this country as well. And I am shocked and I am frightened at the speed in which I see it sweeping in. And so if we have not endured hardship yet, I believe it is coming. And we need to be ready for it. So with that in mind, as we look at these opening four verses of the letter of James... We are being told that we need to be three things. These are the three things that James urges every Christian to be. And these three things are going to be our headings for the remaining of this sermon. First of all, be joyful in affliction. Be joyful in affliction. Secondly, be steadfast in faith. Be steadfast in faith. And thirdly, be mature in all things. Be mature in all things. Be joyful in affliction. Be steadfast in faith and be mature in all things. Now, first of all, James says to the Christians he originally writes to, and he says to every Christian down through the ages, be joyful in affliction. Be joyful in affliction. Just look at verse 2. Just read verse 2 with me. And in verse 2, James says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Now notice here that James assumes that these believers will meet trials of various kinds. Uh, James doesn't say, well, if you meet trials, or, well, you might possibly meet some trials, or even that you're likely to meet trials. No, Jesus, James says, when when 
you meet trials of various kinds. You see, James is certain that every believer in this world will meet trials of various kinds. It is definite, it is beyond question, it is not in doubt. And trials of various kinds are undisputed for the believer. They are unchallenged for the believer. It is undeniable that the believer will receive trials of various kinds in this life. If you are a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will face trials of various kinds. James says it is not a question of if you will face trials, but a question of when. It is only a matter of when. Now what does James mean when he says trials? What is he driving at? Well, he means it in the sense of a hardship that evaluates your quality or your character or your suitability or your endurance or your forbearance. A hardship that puts you to the test. A trial is any affliction, any trouble that puts you under the magnifying glass and we really find out what you're made of. And James says that you will meet trials of various kinds, plural. In other words, you won't just meet one trial in your life. No, you're going to meet many, many trials and they're going to be of completely different types. You're going to meet trials of persecution in your life when you're going to be oppressed because of the faith that you profess in the Lord Jesus Christ. But you're also going to face the trials of bereavement when someone that you dearly love is taken from you. And you may face the trials of economic hardship, redundancy or some other loss of income. Or you may face the trials of your health when your body suddenly falls to sickness. Or you may face the trials of broken family relationships and all the heartbreak that comes with that. You will meet trials of various kinds. Now most people, when they meet the trials of life, they become bitter and resentful. They feel like life has treated them unfairly. And they become aggrieved and they become indignant and they become discontented with this world and with this life. And they're filled with rage and fury because of all that life has thrown at them. And they carry around the pain of their hardships. And it makes them cold hearted. It makes them unfeeling. It makes them harsh people. But James says you're not to be like that. Don't become that kind of person. On the contrary James says count it all joy my brothers. When you meet trials of various kinds. Count it all joy. Now when James says count it, he means reckon it to be all joy. Esteem it to be all joy. Regard it to be all joy. Treat it as if it were all joy to you. Now in saying it in that way, in saying count it all joy, James is acknowledging that the various trials that we shall meet in our lives of themselves are not joyful. If they were joyful, they wouldn't be trials. They're not pleasant. They're not going to be happy experiences for you. But yet James says, count it as if it were joy to you. You know, James isn't here calling for Christians to be masochists who derive some sort of perverted pleasure from their own pain and their own humiliation. And nor is James saying that every Christian should walk around like a Cheshire cat with some inane grin all over our faces, regardless of our circumstances. And nor is James calling upon us to have some sort of superficial, artificial joy. The kind of shallow joy that people put on as a display to other people. No, James is not saying any of that. James is saying that a true Christian, a true Bible-believing Christian should have a deeper more genuine, more sincere joy in their lives, regardless of the trials that they face. He's talking about the kind of joy that the apostles demonstrated back in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 5, the apostles are called in by the Jerusalem council, and they are beaten and they are charged never again to preach in the name of Jesus. And in verse 41 of that chapter, we're told that they left the presence of the council rejoicing.
Now why were they rejoicing? Were they rejoicing in the beating that they had just taken upon their bodies? Were they rejoicing that the council has now told them never again to speak of the name of Jesus? No, they weren't rejoicing in either of those things. They rejoiced, so the book of Acts tells us, because they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. That's why they rejoiced. They rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for the sake of Jesus. No, we don't take any delight in the actual suffering. We take no delight in any persecution that we may face. And we take no delight in bereavement or in poverty or in sickness or in pain. We take no delight in any heartbreak we may face in this world. We take no delight in any misery or anguish or trauma. But if we belong to Jesus Christ, we don't become bitter and resentful because of the various trials that we will meet in our lives. On the contrary, we treat it as if it were all joy to us. And notice that James says, count it all joy, my brothers. My brothers. In other words, he's including himself when he urges the Christians to whom he writes to be joyful in their afflictions. He says, look, you are my fellow believer. You are my fellow Christian. You are my sister in the faith. You are my brother in the faith. And it is just as true of James as it is for you that he counts it all joy when he faces trials of various kinds. You know, I find it very interesting that James, who is the brother of Jesus, if you were here last time when we looked at James, you, you, you'll know that we looked at the life of James, the man who wrote this letter. He was the brother of Jesus. But it's interesting in the opening verse that he makes no mention of his brotherly status when he introduces himself. He merely calls himself James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. But now here in verse 2, he is more than happy. In fact, he goes out of his way to mention his brotherly status, but not to Jesus, his brotherly status to his fellow believer. Because when it comes to facing the trials of our faith, James is just as much involved as all the others. Every single believer, beginning with those in the Old Testament, through all those in the New Testament, down through all the generations of the history of the church, every single believer that's ever stood in a pulpit, every single believer that's ever sat in a congregation has faced trials of various kinds. And so then we are united not only in Christ, but we're also united in our trials and in our hardships. We together counted all joy when we together as brothers and sisters in the Lord face trials of various kinds. James says, count it all joy, my brothers. You're not alone. You should never be alone in your trials and in your hardships. So then this is one of the marks of a Christian. Is that we are joyful even when we are afflicted. Now, is it true of you? Are you someone who does reckon it, esteem it, count it, all joy, when you have to go through trials of various kinds? And I don't mean that you take any pleasure in the suffering or pain that you may be in, and nor do I mean that you just put on a shallow outward display of joy, but I mean that do you have deep, genuine, honest joy when you face trials of various kinds? Do you know the solid joys and lasting treasures that none but Zion's children know? That's the first thing James urges us to be. He urges us to be joyful in our afflictions. But secondly, as he writes to these believers who've been dispersed out of Jerusalem because of persecution, he says, be steadfast in faith. Be steadfast in faith. Now, just look at verse 3 with me. Just look at verse 3. In verse 3, James says, For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. James writes to these believers and he says, This is something you already know. 
And if you are a Christian tonight, this is something you already understand. This is something you've already perceived. You've already noticed it. If you truly belong to the Lord, you already recognize what James is driving at. So that when James says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, you know what that means if you truly belong to him. You already understand it. And when he says that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, you already recognize what he's driving at. You already appreciate it. You already have knowledge and experience of it. So if you're sitting here tonight, or if you're watching the live stream, or listening to the recording at a later date, and you're saying to yourself, I have no idea what this means. To count it all joy when I meet trials of various kinds. Or if you have not got the slightest inkling that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness then you need to ask yourself whether you are truly a believer at all. Because all true believers know the reality of this. James says, for you know. You know. Now what? What do we know? We know that our faith is tested. We know that our faith is tested. Now let me just pause there for a moment. Now, James presupposes that he is speaking to people of faith. He is not speaking to people who are outside of the kingdom. He is not speaking to people who have no faith. He is speaking to believers. And he presupposes that faith exists in your heart and in your life. James is speaking about faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is speaking about those who have trusted themselves to all that Jesus is and all that Jesus has achieved. He is speaking about the assurance of things that are hoped for, the conviction of things that are not seen. He is speaking about those who have truly repented of their sins and trusted wholly in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It all starts with faith. And if you don't have faith, you can never know what it means to count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. And if you don't have faith in your life, well, then you can't know what it means for your faith to be put to the test. And if you don't have faith, then you cannot know what it means for the Lord God to make you steadfast. And faith is a gift. It's a gift of God. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. You can't produce it. You can't manufacture it. Faith is a gift. From God and it is by grace so that none of us can boast but if you do have that faith true genuine saving faith then it will be tested it will be tested your faith will be put to the test many many times your faith will be examined many many times so that it may be proved genuine Now this verse here in James chapter 1 has its parallel in 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter and James are very similar. And in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 6 and 7 the apostle Peter says this. He says you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith which is more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, the various trials and tests that you meet in your life are like the refining fire which purifies your faith, which is to God more precious than gold. And all the misery and all the pain and all the suffering that you experience is working to refine your faith. And all the heartache and all the anguish and all the grief that your life has experienced. It is all working to refine your faith. And every broken relationship, every moment of distress, every act of treachery that you have suffered is all working to refine your faith if you have faith. 
if you have faith. And remember, James says, you know that this is true. You know it, you instinctively understand it if you're a true child of God. And this truth, that your faith is put to the test through various trials, you know, it completely shatters the false gospel of the prosperity churches. They preach and they teach that the Christian life should be full of blessing, full of well-being, full of riches, full of strength, full of happiness, if only you have faith. But James here says the very opposite of that. He says, no, no, no. If you've got true, genuine, saving faith in your heart, you will face trials of various kinds. And your faith will be put to the test. And you know it. You know that this is true. And you know, not only does it shatter the false gospel of the prosperity churches, but it shatters the shallow and artificial positivity of so much of the modern day evangelical scene. Do you know what I mean? The kind of evangelical preaching that is just always endlessly positive. Everything is upbeat. Everything's cheerful. Everything's awesome. Never a negative word is said about anyone or anything. Simply not realistic. When I read the Bible, I believe it because it speaks reality into my heart. And the reality is we face trials of various kinds and our faith is always tested here in this world. And you know that that is true. Now, yes, we should count it as all joy, but not in a shallow, artificial, synthetic way that so many modern day churches do it. But in a truer, deeper way more genuine, more honest, more biblical way. And why? Why is our faith tested like this? Why is our faith to be refined in the fire? James says so that it will produce steadfastness. It will produce steadfastness. That's what it says in verse 3. Just read verse 3 again. In verse 3 it says, For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and that means perseverance that means endurance that means patience the Greek word that is here translated as steadfastness it has its roots in the idea of remaining under something remaining under a great weight or a great burden It is a picture of a person carrying a heavy load for a period of time and yet not buckling under the weight of it. It's the idea of an Olympic weightlifter training hard day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, lifting increasingly heavy weights above his head so that when the time comes, When the time comes for glory, he can lift it and he can hold it and his arms lock in position and his legs lock in position and he doesn't move and he gets the gold medal. He's steadfast. He's persevered in his training. He's been steadfast in his training. And so it is for the Christian. The Christian should never give way or give up in the face of our trials. The New Testament constantly urges us to be steadfast in all of our ways. Luke chapter 8 verse 15. As for that in the good soil, they are those who hearing the word hold it fast in an honest and a good heart and bear fruit with patience. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 4. Therefore we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all of your persecutions and in all the afflictions that you're enduring. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 2. I know your works. I know your toil. And I know your patient endurance, says the Lord. And Revelation chapter 13 and verse 10. Here is a call for the endurance and the faith of the saints. Do you see why it is so important that we are steadfast in our faith? 
It is not good enough just to be steadfast one week and flaky the next. It's not good enough just to present yourself as a strong Christian for a month, two months, six months, even a year, if two or three years down the line you're nowhere. Steadfastness, that is what the Lord Jesus Christ is looking for. Jesus does not want you to be a wavering Christian. He does not want you to be a fluctuating Christian. He does not want you to be a dithering, hesitating, undecided Christian. No, he wants you to be enduring. He wants you to be persevering. He wants you to be steadfast in the faith. Now, does that describe you? Does that describe those of you who are gathered in church tonight? Those of you watching online tonight? Those of you listening to the recording later on? Has the testing of your faith produced steadfastness in your life? Are you persevering in the faith? Are you enduring in the faith? Are you patient in the faith? Or at the first sign of trouble, do you just drift away? Are you going to run away? Are we never going to see you again? Just because the Christian life got hard? James is telling you, to be steadfast in faith. So then those are two things we must be. We must be joyful in our afflictions. We must be steadfast in our faith. And now thirdly, finally, and more briefly, we must be mature in all things. We've got to grow up as Christians. Just look at verse 4. Just read verse 4 with me. And in verse 4, James says, And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, first of all, James is saying, You've got to allow steadfastness to have its full effect. In other words, when you meet trials of various kinds, and when your faith is being tested in the fire, make sure that you are giving maximum opportunity to grow in steadfastness. The more you endure your trials, the more you endure the testing of your faith, the more you will grow in steadfastness. Please, if you are facing a trial or a hardship, don't allow just 10% of steadfastness to develop in your life. Don't allow a quarter, don't allow half, don't even allow two-thirds. Let steadfastness have its full effect. You should aim to have a full measure of endurance. Aim to have a full measure of perseverance as you face affliction. Aim for a full measure of steadfastness. Let steadfastness have its full effect in your life. And James tells you why. He tells you why. He says you should let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete. Now what does that mean? What does it mean when James says that you may be perfect and complete? Is he talking about sinless perfection? Does he mean that if we will allow a full measure of steadfastness to be produced in us that we can attain complete moral perfection here in this world and here in this life? Well, no, I don't believe James does mean that. James does not mean perfection and completeness in that way. He means it in terms of maturity and wholeness. Perfection means maturity. Completeness means wholeness. In other words, if you don't face up to the various trials that you are going to meet in your life as a Christian, and if you do not allow your faith to be tested through the fires, if you do not let steadfastness have its full effect then you will just remain spiritually immature and incomplete. You're going to be spiritually immature and incomplete. And one of the great needs of our day is spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity. Far too many Christians, including those within the evangelical world, are infantile in their thinking and understanding. And I'm not talking about people who've just come to faith. I'm talking about people who've been believers for years and they've just stayed as infants in the faith. They never grow up. 
They never develop. They remain forever as little infants in the faith. And so much of modern day evangelical worship is infantile. It's just not grown up. It's not deep. It's not serious. And so much of modern day preaching is infantile. So much modern day evangelism is infantile. Now why? Why is there this problem with spiritual maturity in our own day? Is it because we've lived lives of comfort and ease for a long time now? Is it because we have avoided various trials of our faith? Is it because we've not allowed steadfastness to have its full effect in our lives? The need of the hour is for mature Christian men and women. We need mature worship. And we need mature preaching. We need mature evangelism. We need mature churches. We need mature prayers. We need mature understanding. We need mature endurance and mature perseverance. That is what James means when he says, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete. He means mature and whole. And he says, if you have that, if you have maturity, if you have wholeness in your faith, you lack nothing. You will lack nothing. And remember who James is writing to. He's writing to believers who've been chased out of Jerusalem. He's writing to believers who have lost everything. They were rejected from the city of Jerusalem under the great persecution that arose following the death of Stephen. And many of them lost their businesses and they lost their homes and they lost their families and they lost their income and they lost their inheritance and they lost everything. And yet James can write to them and he can say, count it all joy, my brothers. When you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. In other words, yes, you may have lost your business and you may have lost your homes and your families and your inheritances. But if you become fully mature in the faith, you will lack nothing. And if that was true of these early Christians who lost so much, oh, how much more should it be true of us who had so many privileges? Be joyful in your afflictions. Be steadfast in your faith. And be mature in all things. Let's pray. Well, Lord God and our loving Heavenly Father, once again your word challenges our hearts and our lives and yet it feeds us we pray that we will nourish ourselves upon it we pray lord god that we will be transformed by what we have heard but lord we do thank you for the very great liberties and comforts that we enjoy in our present situation but lord all the indications are that it's going to become very hard for us as bible believing christians in future years and so Lord we pray that we will turn to your word and that whatever afflictions we may face that we might be joyful and that we might count it as joy and we pray that as our faith goes through the trials of fire that it might produce in us steadfastness that we might become stronger and Lord we pray that in becoming stronger that we will grow up that we will become more mature and lord we ask for your spirit's help in all these things we can't do it in our own power but with you by our side we can do all things and we ask and pray that these things might be to your honor to your glory in jesus name we pray amen